Hey all, this is Ian O'Byrne. I'm taking a look at chapter 1 of 407 and 507. This is the Effective Learning Environments uh, class. Chapter 1 basically is going to outline the focus of the book and let us think a little bit about classroom management, think a little bit about learning environments, think about ways to positively support our learners. If we think about the book, it's really broken up into three parts. Uh, in the summer class, since we have four weeks together, it's a little bit harder to conceptualize that. But part one is basically things that are happening before the school year even begins. That's prep for the school year. That's in our pre-service programs. That's reflections at the end of the school year, preparing for the incoming students uh, in the next year. Uh, part two of the book, chapters three through six, is thinking about the first days, the first weeks of our classes, the, the start of the school year, and how we prepare our learners, how we introduce them uh, to the culture or develop the culture of the classroom with them. Um, some of that is setting rules and structures, setting expectations, identifying desired behaviors in the classroom. But basically, it's the, the first steps uh, as we begin the school year, setting the, the year off on the, the right foot, on the right tone. Uh, part three is getting into ongoing matters, the everyday business of making sure the classroom operates the way that we want it to. So in a typical K-12 school year, we're with students about 180 days. And so if we think about those first couple weeks, let's say you know, you have the first six weeks of the school year, the first eight weeks of the school year. Uh, at that point, we start to see open houses. We start to get into the fall. We start to see some of the fall holidays. Um, and at that point, the initial beginnings of the year start to wear off. And we have to think about what are the structures that are in place so that the class continues to operate the way that we want it to. In addition, if we think about uh, affective variables, if we think about learner dispositions that may uh, are hopefully important to you, we think about uh, you know creativity, flexibility, persistence, empathy, uh, critical stance as a learner, among other things, responsible, self-sufficient learners. We think about self-efficacy, um, and and in order to build those things, those things are only built over a long sequence of time. So yes, a learner or learners might follow your rules and structure or you might build rules and structure with them and that might carry on for a couple days to even a couple weeks. But then after that, uh, learners will often revert to their traditional uh, you know, behaviors or they might just sit in that pattern and that's fine but that might not be where you want them to be uh, in my classes in my experience I didn't want them to stay where they were at the beginning of the year I wanted to make sure they left my classroom much stronger than I got them I wanted to make sure that they were critical thinkers and they uh, believed in their own inquiry and and they they were self-actualized so that I had a lot of work to do and it only it was only after a couple months um, you know, maybe the turn of the year through the holiday break into the new year that that started to really take hold. Um, so we're going to think about what do we do throughout the remainder of the year. So if we think about what it takes to be or what it means to be an effective teacher, we have to think about a couple things. One, we have to think about the affective variables, the affective constructs. Um, affective basically is a, is a term we, we think about those um, attitudes and aptitudes. We think about some of the content or some of the behaviors that are a little bit harder to identify and measure. So we think about things like flexibility or persistence or grit. Uh, we also think about the behavioral. We think about the behavioral components of the class. We think about when the learner is paying attention, when the learner is tuning us out, we think about how do you as the teacher manage that? And then there's also the cognitive. And the cognitive is getting into the content of your course. So if I'm a middle grades math teacher or I'm a second grade teacher, 
what are, what are the, the knowledge, content, and skills that I am teaching my students throughout the year? So you really have to mix those together. You have to think about the affective variables, the affective components, and what we're thinking about, once again, is what are those personality traits, those, those attitudes, those aptitudes that we want to build in our learners? Um, we have to think about behavioral cues. We have to think about behavioral reactions and behavioral response and how we uh, what are our expectations in the classroom and then how do we address uh, behavioral cues or responses that are positive and or negative and last but probably not least is the cognitive is the actual content that you're supposed to be teaching so we have to think about all of those elements and how do we pull them together in our classroom to support our learners so a couple true and false points here uh, generally, prospective teachers are well aware of the behaviors involved in effective classroom management, having spent many years as students observing their teachers' behaviors. So the idea here is that because you have been a teacher, because you've been a student in classrooms for decades, now you are an expert. And because you were either a good student in your classroom or a bad student in your classroom, now you're an expert in classroom management and you know how to deal with it. For all intents and purposes, this is not true. Um, even veteran seasoned educators often have struggles in the classroom with classroom management. They, they are unaware of the complexities um, that are present as we deal with behaviors and behavioral management and classroom management and those the the affective the cognitive and the behavioral those components in our classroom so even veteran teachers struggle but also it's important to recognize the fact that you're first of all not alone in you know feeling some concern about managing a classroom you might think about a classroom you know go see one in your field experience or maybe you have one now that's unruly and it's all over the place and you might be a little bit concerned about what would i do in these instances um that's good that's why we're here uh even if an effective classroom teacher is likely uh even an effective Classroom teachers likely to face instances of student misbehavior. Absolutely true. Um, as I said before, a lot of seasoned educators, they often struggle. I still have times when I struggle um, as an educator. I've taught uh, a number of years in K-12. I provide professional development in K-12. I teach in higher ed or at least try to. And I still have struggles um, with disruptive student behavior and how I address it. And I address it different ways all of the time, all of the time. Um, and there's no magic way, no silver bullet to address all of these. It's important to think about some of the components that we'll discuss in this class and think about how you might address these behaviors. True or false? Developing a sense of community among all members of the class is an important aspect of classroom management. I think that's absolutely true. I think that the most important relationship in the classroom is the is between the student and the teacher. Um, I remember when I was teaching uh, one of my my first year teaching, I went to the assistant principal and I said, you know, I, I feel like if I send students to you and I, I write them up, I give them a disciplinary referral that you're not going to take them in your office and, you know, wave a magic wand and the students magically better and he said absolutely that's right i there's nothing i could do that you can't do and then i said and also chances are the student might be a little bit upset with me that i sort of farmed that out to someone else like i can't handle it uh, and he said yeah that we see that a lot and so the the real key of this um i believe is that relationship between students and teachers i think Having that relationship is the most important thing, and then uh, all things lead from there. I, I think that, you know, for me, one of the keys to classroom management is that wonderful things happen when you treat students like human beings. True or false, studying a book about effective classroom teaching will enable you to guide the classroom uh, smoothly and easily. So if you read this book, if you pay attention to the words coming out of my mouth, if you study hard, Will classroom management be super simple and you'll breeze through your classroom? Absolutely false. I'm sorry, but uh, studying is a good start. 
and this class will help provide you with some of the perspectives and the questions you need to ask and initial ideas for how you want to uh, develop your classroom management plan and and proceed into your classroom but a lot of this is learned through experience it's not only learned through experience I think that you need to have these initial discussions and sort of game out what you would like to do in your classroom but this is a good start um, so if you have experience already guiding youth or working with others you should bring this into bring that into this um, if you're in a classroom now and you see things it gives you an opportunity to sort of uh, debrief and deconstruct and think about what worked and didn't work um, but then also if you don't have experience and you've never been in a classroom that's awesome um, you know read pay attention study listen to these little mini lectures um, but then there's also an opportunity to listen to your colleagues. Uh, so your peers that are in the class, the reason why we're using tools like Flipgrid is so that you can hear their experience. You can learn from them and have a little bit of dialogue and engage with them in, in the content of the course and think about what this ultimately means. So if we think about classroom management, a couple things that we want to consider I believe that cluster management really is uh, a somewhat negative uh, label for this. Um, I never thought that I saw myself as managing uh, my learners, the students in my classroom. Management has this idea or this connotation of being reactive, having to deal with or tolerate uh, the, the human beings in our classroom, whereas Perhaps you want to view yourself as an advisor, as a guide, as someone that will help direct and lead and influence your learners. You want to, v to view classroom management as a more proactive step. So perhaps we should have a different uh, label for this, but classroom management is one of those labels that for some reason tends to stick. So when we think about controlling behavior, there's a lot of different elements that we want to think about here. When we look at behavior in our classroom that's positive and or negative, we, we can quickly identify things that we see that we like that is positive. Uh, those are desired behaviors from the students. And most times as an educator, we focus on the negative behavior. So when we have a class of 15 or 25 students, we often focus on the two students that are sitting in the back of the room not paying attention or sitting in the middle of the room passing notes or sitting in front of the room passed out. And so what we want to think about is who's really controlling that behavior if we think about what managing uh, and classroom management me means. So if we think about who's controlling the student behavior, who influences that student behavior, and then larger questions about how do you influence the student behavior, that's a lot of what this class is about. Um, yes, the student, for the most part, is in control of their behavior. Things happen differently in early childhood as opposed to elementary. Things most definitely happen differently when we move into adolescence and we see our little cherubs in middle school and high school uh, change into uh, other types of individuals. Um, so we want to try to unpack who's really in control here, who, you know, who controls the behavior of the student, um, who has the opportunity to influence the behavior of the student, and then what is your role in all this? Do you have an opportunity to control that behavior? Is it all in the student's hands? Um, is it the peers that influence the behaviors of uh, other students in the classroom? Those are some of the things that we're going to want to think about. We're going to want to think about those intersections. Um, and, and how we influence either positively and or negatively uh, the behaviors of, our, of students in our classroom. So to take another step uh, looking at this, we're going to think about effective teachers. One of the things that we know is that teachers need to pre-plan desired behaviors in the classroom. Uh, and that's where our classroom management plan is going to come into uh, effect or we're going to develop that in this class. It's one of the major assignments in this class is the classroom management plan. And it's going to think about, okay, what is uh, best practice, what are best practices in terms of classroom management? What should I focus on? Um, when we make decisions in that 
classroom management plan, as we pre-plan behaviors, we want to first think about the theory and research in the field. We want to think about best practices. We want to think about professional knowledge. You are not the first teacher that has tried to go into a challenging classroom and motivate recalcitrant students. You're also not the first teacher that's gone into a classroom and tried to uh, help guide and motivate uh, gifted and talented learners. You're also not the first learner, the first student, uh, the first teacher that's gone into a, a classroom with English language learners or students with special needs and try to engage, motivate, scaffold them. Um, and so there's a lot of professional knowledge that's out there. And it's your duty to think about the theory and the research involved and try to make decisions that guide that classroom management plan and think about pre-planning behaviors. And then once you have that plan set, and this is no different than a lesson plan or a unit plan for your classroom, you plan before you go into the classroom, you still want to plan when you think about behaviors for the class. And so you base all that based upon professional knowledge, just like you would with lesson plans and unit plans. And then the last piece of the puzzle is, what are effective responses to shape student behavior, specifically to target behaviors? So if students are are calling out in class, um, what's the appropriate response to that? Do we uh, ignore the student? Do we uh, raise our voice? Do we suspend the student? Are there other decisions that we can make? Um, perhaps if we, if we take ourselves out of our body and we were another teacher in the classroom watching the way that we interacted, we might notice that the teacher uh, sort of calls out, does anyone know the answer? And then these same three, four students, they just frequently call out because that's what they've been trained to do. Um, so, you know, are there behaviors that the students are eliciting on their own? Are there behaviors that are being brought about by reactions or decisions of the teacher? That's what we have to weigh that out. And we have to try to game that out day in, day out, um, sometimes classroom period, you know, by classroom period, sometimes minute by minute. Um, you have to make decisions about what responses you want to make at given times. And the truth of the matter is that you're not going to get it perfect every single time, all the time. Um, I make mistakes frequently. And the, the key is that you can make decisions in your classroom and then you can first off recognize that you made a mistake or that you could have done something differently and then try and figure out what you do differently next time. And that's often a challenge, but that's one of the key components that we try to build in here is we want you to be healthy, reflective practitioners to be able to reflect on your 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 practice, reflect on pedagogy, reflect on assessment, and reflect on that management in your classroom. So we start with the beginning of the school year because we think about building a home. We want a, a any structure to have a good foundation. This includes your classroom. This includes your learning environment. So we want to start with the, the plans, that's our classroom management plan. We want to start with uh, plans that are uh, based on best practices and theory and research. Uh, we don't build a house uh, with general mock-ups that we sort of sketch up out of thin air. We think about some of the uh, knowledge we have about architecture and what is safe and what's not and what uh, the, the contractor uh, believes is safe and is not. And so there's generally a plan before we build that structure, something that we know will stand the test of time. But then we also come back in and we double check. We come back in and we double check uh, to make sure things are operating the way that they should. Uh, so we have the inspector that checks in on the construction of the house and meets with the contractor. And, and we have this, this uh, interaction, this partnership between the contractor and the architect and, and the development of the blueprints to provide a solid structure. But then the inspector that's coming in over time to determine that the work has been performed to the degree of competence specified to make sure that we are doing what we want to do. Um, in the context of our classroom, we're thinking about setting up that classroom management plan, uh, planning for success, 
uh, having that plan based upon good teaching and learning principles, good knowledge of, of the theory and research in behavior um, and educational psychology, and then also thinking about um, checking in to make sure that things are working. And if they are not working, then we make adjustments to that plan. Um, so in the school setting, we're going to think about who really is the architect, who is the contractor, who is the inspector of all of this. Um, the architect may or may not be a, a district-wide uh, curriculum head. It might it may or may not be a department head for your content area. It may or may not be a principal or an assistant principal. Um, if you have a certain amount of latitude in your classroom, you might be the architect of that structure in your classroom. Um, you might be the contractor, the one who enables that and brings that into uh, reality. And then you might be the inspector. Um, a lot of our schools, through the teacher evaluation process, they will have you know, administrators that will come in and observe and give you feedback. Um, but you might also just be the inspector. You might be the one that regularly checks in on your own practice and tries to identify better ways to proceed. So this is one of the things we want to figure out is how much freedom, how much latitude do you have in each of these roles in your classroom? Um, many times if you show uh, some ease and skill and propensity for dealing with classroom management issues then or discipline issues, then administrators are many times, not all the time, they're many times willing to give you a little bit of latitude so that you can run your classroom the way that you want to. Uh, your results may vary. To teach for mastery, uh, the effective teacher must, once again, know how to design, know how to deliver, know, know how to assess. They're talking about pedagogy, the science of teaching and learning. And we have to think about how behaviors interact with that. Um, we know that teaching and learning does not exist in a vacuum. And so we want to think about how do behaviors, student behaviors, impact that. So as we prepare in this class and as you prepare and learn in your future classroom, we want to think about your, your backpack. We want to think about the skills and the habits and the practices and the toolkit that you bring into your classroom. And part of that's going to be your beliefs about teaching and learning. So part of this class, we will dig into your past and we'll ask you what type of learner you were or other experiences. Um, and we'll think about your previous personal experiences. Um, have you had positive role models as educators in the past that ran a really great classroom? Did you have negative experiences in the past where you saw some negative uh, influence or, uh, you know, management, as we said before, between adults and students? We're also going to think about professional goals and objectives. This is the goals and objectives of your lesson plans or your classroom management plan. But this is also your goals and objectives. What do you want in your classroom? Are you there just for the paycheck? Are you there just to uh, teach uh, science to your learners? Or are you there to create the future uh, scientist that this country needs? Are you there to make sure that your, your children are, your learners are uh, literate individuals in their futures? We're also going to think about or consider or prepare for school climate. And we're going to think about the support services that are in buildings now. Who are the people there that are supposed to help you in this experience? You're not alone. Um, there are a number of services that are usually available in K-12 settings. Um, sometimes they don't make themselves known immediately, and it's incumbent on you to know what should be expected, what's in and out of scope for you, and then how do I find and utilize these services in my classroom. And last but not least, we're going to think about training in PD. We're going to think about how we prepare for this. Um, so... This is pretty much chapter one. Uh, you know, at this point in the class, you should have purchased the textbook or found some way to acquire it. We're going to continue to work our way through Oaks. Um, and please uh, start to think about interviewing a teacher. 
Uh, for your second journal prompt, you're going to need to interview someone that's in the field so that you can get some idea of what a real classroom looks like. Um, and it is my hope that by pairing up our classes, we can unite with others. So hopefully all is well with you. Hopefully you're safe. And that's a wrap.